You've probably heard of the term solar punk. If not, relax, here's a 30 second explanation. It features storylines where the humanity has either won the fight for the climate or is heading there. These stories themselves are optimistic, yet not escapist. The solutions they present need to be somewhat realistic. So, they are based on existing or possible technologies and not on some magical nanomachines. Sun. And finally, this victory is achieved by cooperating with nature and not by conquering it in an eco-modernist fashion. That's the gist of our longer 7-minute introduction to Solarpunk that you can watch right here. It might be a good idea to do it now or after watching this video. No worries, we'll remind you. Anyway, even after these 7 minutes, your knowledge of Solarpunk is... Quite good, actually, because the movement is still in its infancy. Still, it's a good idea to check up on it and see how it develops. If it already reached the walking stage, does it have a proper diet, and most importantly, what are its needs and how do they match up to expectations and criticisms? This video started out as sort of answer to another Polish leftist YouTuber, but then it became its own thing, because a lot of the problems with Solarpunk that he pointed out we also saw in the comments under our videos. By the way, if you happen to speak or study Polish, please do subscribe to Mysticism Popkulturowy. Link in the description. This time we've also invited a friend to help us, and he's a real-life Solarpunk too. Culture and Nature who wears pants in this family? Let's start with philosophy in the age of the Anthropocene. A quick reminder, the Anthropocene is a proposed geological epoch in which, according to geologists and social researchers, it is human activity that became the main geological force. We've got a whole video on it and we'd suggest you to check it out later because this section is built on some of the philosophical concepts introduced there. But today we'll focus on the most important challenge that we're faced with the relation between human and non-human life. Does Solarpunk really offer a unique view on it, or is it just a continuation of what science fiction was saying before? We believe it's the former. If we look at the probably most famous example, the Nebula-awarded novella Psalm for the Wild Built by Becky Chambers. Before we do that, however, we need to examine the main dualism at play here, that of culture and nature, and how it played out over the ages. Because without analyzing it, we're doomed to repeat the worst take ever, that it's one or the other. And since we're civilized and have a bad relationship with nature, then the uncivilized peoples must have some intuitive ability to live in justice and harmony with nature. The trope of the noble savage was a thing ever since we had some kind of civilization and some kind of savages to compare it to. But it peaked in the Romantic era and their fantasies of non-white or pre-Christian people living in perfect communion with nature. But enough about the Cameron Avatar movies. Let's look at a basic problem underlying any kind of humans having just relationships with the non-human world. That justice is a human concept. Although we see that there is an underlying understanding of fairness in some social animals. That kind of assumes that if we want justice, then humans need to be the ones who dispense this justice. And that means that these concepts of justice are going to be anthropocentric, focused on the human as something better, or at the very least central to the whole project. In the most generous interpretation, it meant that the human was a custodian of this earth, since only he was endowed with a soul, or, since the Enlightenment period, with reason. Same thing. In the least generous interpretation though, it meant that the Earth is his, and that's it. All of these other species that are there for him can just wish for not being hunted for sport. By the way, you might have noticed that we're calling the human in the masculine. It's not an accident, because now we need to talk about the dualism that has shaped the Western thought since... Since there was a Western thought. So, when Jerusalem met Athens, when philosophy met Christianity, this dualism says that reason, spirit, form and the masculine was the better, higher part of the world, destined to rule it, and where emotion, body, matter and the feminine was to be subservient to it. While many cultures had some sort of dualism or metaphysical forces, yang and yin, day and night, masculine and feminine, active and passive, they didn't always form a hierarchy. 
It was a particular mixture of Christianity and philosophy that helped to place one squarely above the other, and it's a burden we still carry to this day. The reasons for that are complex, but one of them is that people often conflate this dualism with the second big dualism, good versus evil. It's a Christian thing, or more specifically, a feature of Abrahamic religions, related to the problem of evil. If God is good, then why is there evil in the world? But the difference between the dualism of yin-yang and good-evil and two dualisms is, in fact, huge. First one is metaphysical, so concerning with the way things exist. And second is ethical, concerning with the way we should act. Think of it like chess. The yin-yang dualism would be what the game is made of, the black and white pieces, while the good-evil one would be how we play. Do we play well or poorly? Just because there are two colors of pieces and two ways of playing doesn't mean that a color corresponds to the way of playing. Still, we don't need to look at good and evil to create a hierarchy of opposites. One opposite could be better because it controls the other one. Like, you can say that your reason is better than your body because it can keep everything in check, otherwise the body would just go and eat all the donuts or whatever. So, masculine, reasonable and spiritual is the higher and better thing, while feminine, emotional and corporeal was the lower and worse thing. And so you had culture as this masculine thing and nature as this feminine thing. All of this is obviously a patriarchal system. Patriarchy here doesn't mean that all men have it better than all women, or even that most men have it better than most women. It means that its definition of masculinity includes some kind of natural dominance over femininity on this highly abstract philosophical or metaphysical level. For a good example, look no further than Jordan Peterson. He's not just saying that men are like this and women are like that, but that the masculine is order and feminine is chaos. You can't have all order and all chaos. Both are necessary, but you need to have a little more order than chaos, otherwise things fall apart. So order needs to dominate over chaos, so that the world could exist. And it's only then that you take these abstract and apply them to real-life gender dynamics. For the longest time, men should dominate women not because they lust for power, it's just… that's what they are made for. It's their burden. Like women are for making babies and feeding them, cleaning and all that other low-level material stuff, while men are made to manage all of that from a higher level. But here's the thing. Most of us already know that this patriarchal idea of gender relations is a bad way to run things. Many of us also feel the same way about the abstract philosophical framework in general. That it's not true that one of the opposites should dominate or control the other. Still, this mentality is very much baked into a lot of our culture, and we can't really be sure which parts of it do work and which don't, and why. All of that brings us to humanity and nature, where we, again, see the same dualism. The human, capital V, capital H, is masculine and reasonable, while nature is feminine and instinctive. And while it might be easy to say, well, let's just make them equal, there's again the inherent problem of justice, that it's a human concept. So to understand the problem better, let's set some logical boundaries for the outcome of this human-other species debate. While the most extreme boundaries would be the die-off of either humans or all the other species, they aren't really interesting. Humans dying out would put an end to philosophy and justice, while mass dying out of other species means biodiversity collapse, which would cause humanity to die out as well. So let's set some narrower logical boundaries, the most extreme scenarios in which humanity does survive. The weird thing with humans is that they invented the whole culture thing and the whole civilization thing and thus set themselves apart from the other species. They have complex system of behaviors and beliefs which they pass to following generations. This culture changes, and with it, the stuff that humanity needs for flourishing. Currently, it seems like humanity needs to reach the end of its economic growth, which is... Uh, let me check the notes here really quick. Uh, oh, yes. Infinite. Considering the planet is finite, the outlook for other species isn't that good. 
Well, one way of resolving it would be that humanity leaves Earth and goes out to the rest of the solar system, but that doesn't seem likely, since even the most unfriendly or devastated areas on Earth are still far less hostile to human beings than the surface of Moon or Mars. One difficult problem being the radiation levels, for example. Another one is the decoupling theory, where we grow so much that eventually continue growing while consuming less and less raw materials. It makes sense if you think about it, your smartphone fits in your pocket and has way more processing power than a computer the size of a room in the 70s, so that's less stuff, right? But if you look at the manufacturing chain of your smartphone and all of the materials, energy and international transport that it uses, things are far more bleak. That option seems even less likely than colonization. So that's the techno-progressivist view. On the other hand, you've got deep ecology, a school of thought developed in the 70s, saying that every life is just as precious. Humans have no more a right to the planet than other species, so they should reduce their numbers to, estimates vary, from 2 billion to 100 million people and radically decrease their use of, well, everything, so they can fit in the Earth system in a stable fashion. This is utopian in the sense that in order to achieve it peacefully, whole humanity would not only have to unite, but also unite under the banner of deep ecology. As history teaches us, you can't change the views of every single being to, say, Christianity, veganism, atheism, or whatever. The only effective long-term political processes of modernity were based on finding balance within a diversity of opinions. So it seems like the non-peaceful manner is the only option then. And that kind of made sense in the 70s, since there was this whole risk of nuclear apocalypse which would reduce human numbers substantially, and also, hopefully, make people more peaceful and deeply ecological. Sadly, as we found out in the 80s, even a small-scale one would cause a so-called nuclear winter, meaning a layer of atmospheric ash would cause a drastic cooling down of the climate for a few years, which would decimate species which aren't cold-resistant. After that, we'd have a nuclear summer, when the ashes fell down. Within a year or two, we'd experience heating of the climate to the levels of above what we have now, and that would decimate all the cold resistant species. It's like climate apocalypse with extra steps, but the steps are covered in spikes and burning tar. You might stop here and say, guys, shouldn't you do, like, philosophy? What does it have to do with some nuclear ashes or material footprints or whatever? Why such crazy scenarios? Well, that's because the Anthropocene is the blending of history and geohistory. Before, the geophysical limits used to be walls that our lofty political ideas would just run against and that was that. Any further progress was impossible. Now we have the capacity to tear the walls down and have the roof collapse on our heads. Okay, so far we know that humanity can't be special, but also that it needs to be a little bit special. So where do we find the middle ground? Humanity. Living a double life. Zoe and Bios. For that we need a bit of theory. An ancient Greek distinction between two definitions of life. Zoe and Zelda. Um, sorry, I meant uh, Bios. Zoe and Bios, and we'll do that by looking at two thinkers who brought this division into modern debate, Hannah Arendt and Giorgio Agamben. The simplest way to explain Zoe would be life as life, a set of biological properties allowing living beings to survive and reproduce. When you look at a forest, you see Zoe, an unending cycle of life, where living organisms are born, multiply, and decay, thus becoming nutrition for new generations of organisms. While their individual lives do have a beginning and an end, Zoe in itself doesn't, because it pays no attention to singular beings. If you want to remember it quickly, you can associate it with zoology. Meanwhile, bios is something completely different. You can associate it with biography. It's an individual life experienced consciously from beginning to end in a linear fashion. Bios, by definition, is accessible to humans only. But stay tuned for the science fiction part. Arendt describes this division in her classic book The Human Condition while drawing a distinction between what she calls work and labor. 
Work is something that happens on the level of Zoe and serves to maintain our lives. It doesn't create anything permanent, because Zoe is going to overgrow it anyway. Work is cooking, cleaning, showering, weeding a garden, or fixing the house so it doesn't collapse. It's an attempt at maintaining or stopping some part of reality at its current form. We are forced to do these Zoe-level actions because we ourselves are part Zoe. So for example, you need to keep your Zoe, your body, hydrated or it dies. Or you need to sweep leaves and dirt from the stone path or it disappears. Ultimately, the circle of Zoe will win. The path will get completely covered in a year or 3000 years. The house will fall apart. You will die. But that's where BIOS comes in. BIOS level actions are called labor, and their goal is creating objects that are permanent in some way. It's taking something out of the flow of Zoe, something that is made by a human and will last longer than a purely natural creation. It doesn't need to be the Great Pyramid or the Odyssey, just something that lasts a little bit longer than it would in the metabolism of Zoe. It can be something as simple as a whisk broom that you use to sweep the path free of leaves and dirt. Of course, it'll rot away someday, but it'll be useful longer than, say, a stick that an ape uses once to reach a piece of fruit, and then puts it away. Of course, maintaining that broom will still require work, but that's the key difference. Labor creates, work maintains. Labor is bios, work is zoe. The second philosopher, Agamben, looks at bios and zoe in a manner that is more judging, political, and dark. For him, Zoe is, again, life as life, and Bios is human life. But it's the latter one that is the subject of politics. Okay, quick question. What is politics really about? Like, really, fundamentally, at its core. What is its most direct and primal expression, one that started it and one that it still, ultimately, revolves around? The answer is violence. And to be more precise, Politics is about deciding who is an acceptable target of violence and to what degree. And because it's hard to justify violence against citizens, you need to make them less than citizens. Like criminals or repressed minorities are these less than citizens. It's okay to bring a bit more violence on them. The most extreme version of that would be making them less than human. What this means is that the political power lies with people who can take your bios away from you, in part or in the whole. Of course, that doesn't mean that they take away your personal perception of yourself as bios, only that you're not seen as bios by others. So it's the state that can ultimately decide how much of a bios you have. Ultimately, full bios is something reserved for a model citizen and on the other extreme, you lose all of it, and are turned into Zoe. Here, Agamben recalls the ancient term of Homo Caesar, a person outside of the law whom the citizens may treat however they like, with no repercussions. This state is also called bare life, and it's the state that the prisoners of concentration camps were in, at basically the level of non-human animals. Both of these models show an inherent hierarchy, in Agamben's view, Bios is something that elevates Zoe. Without Bios, Zoe is nothing. And in Aren's model, there is still some inherent superiority. After all, the results of labor are more permanent and human above mere nature. What it means is that while Bios and Zoe don't necessarily fit into the yin-yang dualism from before, they can be made to fit. You might have heard that postmodernism doesn't really like binary opposites. And this is the precise reason. Not only do they offer an oversimplified view of the world that falls apart at closer scrutiny, because what exactly is being extremely animal and extremely human? Would an example of an animal-like human be someone who's unconscious or someone who's acting irrationally because of great emotion? And if the second one is true, then what about a father giving up his life to save his child? or a soldier jumping on a grenade to save her squad? Is it a triumph of free will that overcomes survival instinct itself, or just protecting your own genes, or your own tribe? If a musician is performing full of emotions, are they less human than a mathematician devising a proof? 
This is just a short example of some questions that can be raised to show how what we see as a simple binary is in fact a mixture of complex structures. Now that we know the pitfalls of dualism and are intimately familiar with the bios zoe distinction, we'll do aliens. But not in a Captain Kirk from Star Trek way. We're gonna do aliens. In the discussion with the other YouTuber, we were suggested an example of an old sci-fi book that dealt with the human nature issue, Speaker for the Dead by Orson Scott Card. Putting Card's homophobia aside, the book is brilliant and it's still a great read. While it's a part of the Ender saga, it can be read well enough alone. Here's a mostly spoiler-free summary. It takes place a few thousand years after humanity's war with the Formix, the only alien race ever encountered and which has been thoroughly exterminated. Now humanity discovered a new intelligent species patronizingly called piglets. Probably the most famous concept from this book is the hierarchy of familiarity, with the names taken from future Swedish. The Nordic language recognizes four orders of foreigners. The first is the Oderlander, or Utlaning, the stranger that we recognize as being a human of our world, but of another city or country. The second is Framling. This is the stranger that we recognize as human, but of another world. The third is the Ramen, the stranger that we recognize as human, but of another species. The fourth is the true alien, the Varelse, which includes all the animals, for with them no conversation is possible. They live, but we cannot guess what purposes or causes make them act. They might be intelligent, they might be self-aware, but we cannot know it. The main problem of the previous war was that humans and Formix treated each other as Varelse, while in reality it was just a big misunderstanding. The Formix are posthumously labeled as Ramen, thanks to a sort of elegy book written by the main character. This causes everyone to fear that the same thing might happen with piglets, even though some really gruesome things are happening. While the book is self-contained, in the slightly worse sequel, Xenocide, Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. It turns out that the planet might actually host up up to five intelligent species, all with very different, um, biological status. Now everyone needs to work out who's ramen to whom and whose existence is an inherent threat to whom. And they need to do it rather quickly or they all will be on the receiving end of being nuked from orbit. Okay, I know it sounds contrived, but it's just because we wanted to keep it short and avoid spoilers. Everything makes a whole lot of sense, especially in the first book, once the intricately placed dominoes begin to fall. So, if we look at this hierarchy, our obvious problem is that it describes a relation bios to bios, between separate intelligent beings. Animals are varelse by definition. That's it. Case closed. Now, if we tried to make a very bad faith reading of this bios zoe relationship, we could compare it to a relationship between Christian colonizers and pagan savages. Looking that way, all of life is just Zoe, and it doesn't deserve any special treatment until it proves that it is bios. And there's a common science fiction trope about scientists who, in the nick of time possible moment, find a proof of some species being intelligent, thus preventing a genocide. So let's imagine the same story. Just instead of the future, it's set a few hundred years ago. And instead of a recently discovered uninhabited planet, it's the recently discovered uninhabited new world. In the climax of the story, our, a band of scholars, arrive, heaving and panting to the command tent of the conquistadors. Their leader is currently deep in prayer, asking for the strength and divine light to finally purge the capital of the savage Zhapka people. So our heroes frantically start explaining the myth they've just uncovered. Of Orlen, god of thunder of the Zhapkas. Orlen, they say, had a son that walked among the mortals and was killed by them. But then, a Biedronka bird, which is now sacred to the Zhapkas, descended from the clouds, touched Orlen's son and returned him to life. Oh, I do not care for the heresies of these degenerate half-animals. The conquistador brushes them off. 
While they may have indeed come from the same Garden of Eden as us Europeans, they have long since lost any spark of humanity by giving themselves over to demons such as this Orlen. And then, when the situation appears hopeless, the youngest of our scientists opens his backpack, revealing a small cage with a young, scared Biedronka bird perched inside. And a look comes across the face of the conquistador, first of terror, then of awe. For he sees that what he believed to be a false idol, the Biedronka, is in fact a dove of purest white. He falls to his knees, tears streaming from his eyes, and begs God for forgiveness. For he understands now that these lowly savages were in fact worshipping the Holy Spirit itself. And even though their blackened, shriveled bodies have devolved so far from Adam and Eve's slender grace, in their soul there still burned fire of the Spirit. And thus it was made clear that it was possible to communicate, nay, coexist with them, for they were also children of the one true God. Okay, this analogy might have been a bit crude, but it does drive the point home that the separation between Ramen and Varelse comes down to a distinction between intelligent beings, which we can communicate, and others, who may be intelligent or may be animals. But in the end, it doesn't matter. If communication isn't possible, we don't care. This framework doesn't need to be anthropocentric by default. Any kind of intelligent species could use it, and in the later books, they do. In the end, it all comes down to communication, which is a human trait. From a zoe-centric perspective, however, communication or intelligence are nice, but they are just a skill. Not that much different from producing nice fruit, excreting a particularly nutrient-rich poop, or photosynthesis. Sure, intelligence gives our species a great capacity to act, but that still doesn't make us as unique as we'd like. Especially because, if we look at humanity as a whole, from sufficiently far away, it still acts as every other organism. It consumes all possible resources and procreates. Nothing but pure survival instinct. So, the whole deal with solar punk is that we need to break with this supremacy of bios over Zoe, and to use our intelligence to coexist with the rest of the biosphere without communication. Oh, and without some telepathic connection with intelligent spirits of nature. If there's some kind of Gaia, like the one proposed by the Belgian philosopher Isabel Stengers in our video on the Anthropocene, then it should not be the same bios that we can communicate with. Okay, we might try to understand it as some kind of bios, but that's just because of our limitations. We're just a very little hominid with a very little brain and we just can't understand nature if we don't anthropomorphize it. But still, it's nothing more than our mental shortcut. Zoe just is. We cannot guess what purpose or causes makes it act. And to see how to make that work well, we now need to do the robot. Again, not in that way. And now we need to do the robot. Having said all that, let's discuss the psalm. We'll avoid spoilers, but that's mostly because it's hard to spoil the book, as its charm lies in the interaction between Dex, the titular monk, and Moskap, the titular robot. The story takes place on an alien moon, which is basically an alternate version of Earth. Few hundred years before the book, robots have gained self-awareness and decided to stop serving humans. Surprisingly, humans took it with dignity, signed a treaty of equality with the robots, and decided that if they don't know what caused the robots to gain self-awareness, then it's better not to risk it again and drop the whole robotics thing. And since we're here, they said, we might as well do some degrowth, refocus the technology on the betterment of our lives instead of production, and help the wrecked ecosystem by leaving half of the planet to nature. And the robots were like, so long, and thanks for all the chips and they walked to that other half, never to be heard from again. Until, obviously, one of them runs into Dex. 
So we have the tired trope of an artificial intelligence meeting a human intelligence, and you know what follows next. The human gets an existential crisis, whether they are any different from the robot, and the robot starts wondering what it would take for it to become a real boy. Yara yara. The thing is, none of this is mentioned once. Like, for example, no one questions whether a robot's self-awareness is real. Not robots, not decks. Because, dear children, this is not a book about bios. Sure, Moscap is interested in Dex as a person, but it's more interested in them as Zoe. You see, robots have a general fascination of the physical world and its processes. And all these hundreds of years they've been roaming this nature preserve and just observing stuff. Observing Zoe. At one point, not long after their departure, they've collectively decided that they won't repair themselves indefinitely. If a robot gets too worn out to function, it gets disassembled into parts which are then used to construct new robots. Aha, you might say, so the Pinocchios really are wondering what it's like to be a real Zoe. Well, yes, in a way, but it's only robots that are excluded from the world of Zoe. Sure, the process of dying gets robots closer to Zoe and to nature, but humans aren't really that close to nature either. Three reasons for that. First, humans don't have contact with, like, nature, nature. The preserves are off-limits to them. Entering them isn't punishable by human law per se, but second, it's punishable by nature law. Basically, if you go there, you're gonna get eaten, or starve, or get lost, and no one is gonna go and find you. Because humans, unlike robots, are way more fragile and edible. But the most important reason is the third one seen in this quote. So humans carry their bios around as a form of primordial sin. Obviously this is a biblical analogy and doesn't show up in the book. This is just our speculation. Just as Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and lost their innocence, so did the humans eat from the tree of bios. Or instead of bios you can say intelligence or culture or technology. In this context they all work just as well. And just like Adam and Eve couldn't keep running around naked, so were these bios-owning humans unable to live without their knowledge of culture or technology. The point of difference is that Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden while these humans understood that they can't fulfill their bios needs without greatly changing the ecosystem. That, as a species with bios, they can't really fit into nature proper, even if they want to thrive, even in a solar punk way. So the only way that a Garden of Eden could exist is somewhere else, somewhere they are not. Just a side note, while this idea of rewilding huge areas on half of the planet and making them off-limits works well in the book, it would be much more difficult in the real world. Because, as you may guess, it probably wouldn't be London, Paris or New York that got rewilded. But areas which are more, uh, natural or, um, native. And with natives, who would need to be resettled without caring for their cultural heritage. It would be basically the same reason as John Locke when he explained that we should take land away from the natives and turn them into farms, precisely because they don't have farms, so they don't use it. Only this time it would be about who gets to keep the land, and it would be, again, people with most farms. By that we mean industry, culture, infrastructure, and so on. Anyway, that's a difficult conversation for a later time, and also one that we would need to have if our whole world went solar punk. So it's not like a solar punk world would be a boring utopia of everything being perfect with no fierce discussions. Okay, but back to our book and their half-planet Garden of Eden. While humans are confined to living in areas with a low, but existing, ecological footprint, robots have a very low support needs and don't carry any burden of guilt for ravaging the planet. So they just roam the preserve like any other animal and don't really need much except for energy, which they can get from a solar cells. If you add the fact that they are waterproof, rugged and inedible, it means that robots can easily thrive within the world of pure Zoe. Paradoxically, they coexist not as a part of it, but as something separate, yet not harmful. 
All of that makes for two interesting perspectives of two species being distanced from Zoe from two different sides. Robots aren't Zoe, yet they can effortlessly coexist with it. Humans are Zoe, but because of their bios, they can only coexist with Zoe on their own terms. So, neither of those two are closer to nature. There is also one interesting scene when Dex, while cooking, asks for Moskap to pick them some thyme growing by the road. Moskap first hesitates, and then refuses. It never killed a living being for survival and finds it personally difficult. Okay, that's enough for the novella. We've only covered the first part. The second is also very interesting. Like the main conundrum in the third chapter, which basically is about the work-labor distinction and how robots aren't Zoe. Anyway, it should now be kind of evident how this kind of story couldn't exist or at least be popular in 20th century terms. Back then we were still fascinated by cybernetic implants, which blurred the line between human and machine. By the way, it's something Solarpunk doesn't really care about. Yes, cybernetic implants are still part of the human, or precisely, a biological homeostatic system that is a human body. But they wouldn't give them some extraordinary powers. While cyberpunk problems with implants were more focused on technology, like firmware failures, or hacking, or cyberpsychosis, Solarpunk would look more at problems of the system as a whole. So, having a cybernetic arm with super strength would end up giving you super arthritis, because every implant is a part of Zoe's system. It could be nice, it could be useful, but you don't end up with something more than human. Just a human with slightly different capabilities, and slightly different problems to match them. Okay, that said, let's move to the second part of the video, where we discuss problems with solar punk literature in general. Where do they come from, if they even exist, and how to address the ones that do? Hieroglyphs and heroes. Why we can't have nice things. And for that we need to talk about hieroglyphs and the hero's journey. In our 7 minute video on solarpunk we said that to us solarpunk is an antidote to the quagmire of political imaginary of the last few decades. So now we'll present the theory behind it. But instead of philosophers we'll turn to writers. More specifically, the science fiction writer Neil Stevenson. In his essay titled Innovation Starvation, he presents two ways in which science fiction can cause technological changes in the real world. One is straight up inspiring kids to become researchers or scientists. And it's cool and all, but also quite self-explanatory. The other one, however, introduces hieroglyphs, which are as simple recognizable symbols on whose significance everyone agrees, and which have a coherence and internal logic that makes sense to scientists and engineers. What it means is that sci-fi literature can do more than just provide inspiring visions. It can also provide ones which are uniting, standardizing reference points. One of the examples that Stevenson gives is how the Apollo and Gemini space programs were influenced by the so-called golden age of science fiction with their brave stories of space exploration and their brave hieroglyphs. For an example of such a trope, imagine you see a street in a city full of neon-lit skyscrapers at night and figures with cybernetic arms and legs are walking around. One look and you know you're dealing with a cyberpunk setting. And this, in turn, means that you can expect megacorporations ruling over everything, lone hackers fighting the system, and a high-tech and high-poverty society. Yet hieroglyphs are something more than just settings for stories. Because, you see, in cyberpunk stories we expect some form of cyberspace. And we don't need the author to explain how it works over multiple paragraphs. No one likes multi-page info dumps. Yet we also knew what the cyberspace was way back in the 90s. Back when people had dial-up internet and AOL floppy disk punch cards or whatever. And it's the shared understanding of cyberspace that gave us a shared vision of the internet and how to improve it. How to better punch these cards, flop these disks, and, in general, dial it all the way up. Stevenson describes how much easier it was, for example, for NASA space projects, when everyone working on them had a common view of how rockets should be, as described by Robert A. Heinlein. Of course that doesn't mean that these sci-fi ideas need to be followed to the letter, because many elements are exaggerated for story reasons. 
What it means is we need to use this mental image in order to extract from it what works, or at least what may work. And that's precisely what solar punk is, at least for the moment. The search of new hieroglyphs, often in a conscious fashion, so that we can create a common mental space which can be shared among activists, hackers, gardeners and urban planners, so that they won't need to restate every time that Hold on, do we really want to have in our world a Bill Gates type of savior and his sustainable jet biofuel? Or No, centralizing everything is not what Solarpunk is about. We're saying this because many of you left comments both here and on our Polish channel, which understood Solarpunk as some kind of grand central plan that we just need to implement. And if Solarpunk is anything else, then it's worthless. But that's quite far from the truth. There's a ton of things which Solarpunk hasn't worked out. And it's not going to. Because it's not its job. For example, the future world isn't gonna be a network of local communities with decentralized worker co-ops making like graphic cards, MRI machines or communication satellites. That's because a hieroglyph is a framework, a scaffolding for our collective imagination, and not a finished blueprint. The vision we've been presented is impossible in very much the same way that it's impossible for Golden Age sci-fi rocket ships to fly to Mars in 10 hours. However, these are mostly a matter of quantity, not quality, so neither of them create a dissonance within a hieroglyph. It still points us towards some ideal direction that we should follow. Of course, the results may not be as rosy, just look at what happened to cyberspace. It turned out that having immersive trippy visuals isn't exactly a good way to browse the web at all. In the same vein, it might turn out that this solarpunk decentralization ends up becoming something completely different to what we imagine now. Because it's important to keep in mind that changes in culture and thought are always gradual. Rarely do we get both a new perspective and a new language to describe it with. The initial descriptions of new ideas almost always happen in terms of the old language, otherwise they wouldn't be understandable and widely accessible. And in the 80s, it was much easier to understand moving through a sea of information as an actual movement through a 3D space than having like a bunch of documents, but like indexed very well. Because when most people then thought of indexes, they'd think about drawers upon drawers of index cards sorted from A to Z. And even though modern web browsing looks more like the second vision, it still works more like the first one. We're going to leave the hieroglyphs here for now and get to the second topic. And that's the problem with the way that we write books out here in the West. Oh, and a bit of history of ideas. So you've probably encountered the hero's journey even if you don't know the term. It rose to prominence in 1949, when a literary scholar, Joseph Campbell, created his theory of the monomyth, that all of the world myths speak of the same thing, of how the hero journeys to change himself and the world. Campbell based it on the way that the psychoanalyst Carl Gustav Jung understood myths, as expressions of some universal truths about humanity which may very well be mystical, transcendent and whatnot but they are in the first place psychological. And actually, it's more like two sides of the same coin. Humans created myths, which shaped humans, which shaped myths, and so on. The problem with Jung and his teacher Sigmund Freud was that they weren't really psychologists in any modern sense. They were more like thinkers trying to detach psychology from philosophy, and so their descriptions of the human mind were more like philosophical ideas and heavily based on contemporary social norms. This created a particular way of looking at the human condition, which has some continuation in psychology, but is very often used in social philosophy and similar studies, like the three raccoons in a trench coat that form Slavoj Žižek. Oh, and since we're here, Please don't look at Jung through the benzodiazepine tinted glasses of Jordan Peterson. While he probably knows a bit more about Jung than, well, all the other stuff he pretends to know about, his reactionary perspective is just his own fearful re-reading of Jung and ignoring a lot of what has been written about Jung in the meantime. And he's also treating these archetypes not as an expression of the human psyche or the collective unconscious, but as if they were some immutable physical constants, an eternal God-given blueprint of what humans should be. 
That really wasn't Jung's view, as he believed that the collective unconscious can indeed change through an alchemical process, spoke about the age of Aquarius, and so on. And if Peterson ever spoke about any age of Aquarius, it would be in the context of these post-Aquarian neo-Marxists coming to our universities and taking over our ages. Wait, where was I? Oh, right, the hero's journey. It reached a mainstream success thanks to the fact that the chronological first part of Star Wars, A New Hope, was completely based off of Campbell's plan, which goes more or less like this. 1. The hero is seen in his everyday life in the ordinary world. 2. The call to adventure appears. 3. The hero hesitates to answer the call and gets pushed into it. 4. The hero gains the supplies, knowledge and confidence needed to commence the adventure. 5. The hero commits wholeheartedly to the adventure and enters the special world. 6. The hero explores the special world, faces trial and makes friends and enemies. 7. The hero discovers the center of the story and the special world. 8. The hero faces the greatest challenge yet and experiences death and rebirth. 9. The hero receives a reward for it, or the fullness of his power. 10. The hero returns to the ordinary world, or continues to an ultimate destination. 11. The hero experiences a final moment of death and rebirth, so he is pure when he re-enters the ordinary world. 12. The hero returns with something to improve the ordinary world. This isn't Campbell's original 17-step plan, but a 2007 version for writers, created by the Hollywood producer Christopher Vogler. We only changed the hero's pronouns, you probably know why. Do you see how many sentences have the structure of hero, verbs, something, something? It's 10, by the way. Basically, in every step, it's the hero who does something. Only in two or three, something happens to him. And this is what we're used to. By we, we mean the consumers or modern popular culture. Because if you look at a lot of literary classics, especially from before the 20th century, this journey tends to be visible less and less. Now, Campbell came up with this idea quite a while ago, over 70 years now, and as it pretty much always is with these kinds of philosophical discoveries, what was meant to be the theory of everything became a theory of some particular things. It's actually kind of sad how his main contribution to the wider culture are 1. The formulaic script of Marvel movies and 2. The secret manifesting new AG Follow Your Bliss. They did our boy Joe dirty. By the way, if you get a chance to watch his last series of interviews The Power of Myth, please do. They're just the perfect depth. Accessible yet engaging. They're especially interesting if you're not into religion. They give a good outlook of this notion of humanistic spirituality and understanding of myth. But now it's time for the however part. And that's gonna be a really big however. However, this very accessibility is the problem. The reason that Campbell's vision of spirituality is so easy to digest is that it's made with the Western viewer in mind providing the perfect mix of individualism and predetermination that they can accept. It's not really a description of any universal laws, rather it's an attempt at naturalizing some features of the Western society. It's using myths to make prevalent individualism a bit more healthy, because, well, a hero transcends his boundaries and the society as a whole reaps benefits, is a much healthier version of it than the Wolf of Wall Street kind of individualism. But it's still not the human condition, it's just the condition of the 20th century. You can clearly see that some of these ideas are old, and this is why we used the masculine pronouns. You see, his approach to women in the 50s in the US was... Well, approach to women in the 50s in the US. At best, the hero was a guy, and the best case a gal could hope for is that she's going to be his prize at the end of the journey or like some nice lady helping the hero along the way. Worst case is that she gets to be deleted from the monomyth, in order to make it work as a monomyth. Because, you see, the hero-shaped hole that every human psyche has inside apparently doesn't have a cutout for boobs. That's by far not the only reason why Campbell's ideas are being increasingly more criticized. For a way more skating criticism, see Maggie May's Fishes videos. Link in the description. The main reason, however, seems to be that it's an idea which time has come, 
as in the time to put this idea in a good, nice retirement home, or maybe give it some time to travel around the world, see the sights, actually meet some foreign people, and not bother the public discourse anymore. While it still makes sense on an individual level, it tells us nothing on how to organize society, and if it's used too much, it may actually end up preventing us from changing it. So Campbell's theory was a myopic and overly focused on contemporary American individualism. But we have to keep in mind that when we look at the history of ideas, it's basically a rule and not an exception. Even the visionaries aren't free from the influence of their times, and new great ideas are almost always going to be tainted by the contemporary prejudices to some degree. It was true with Campbell, it's true with us, and it's going to be true with you. Okay, maybe it was more true with Campbell, but still. Depending on how old you are, you might have already experienced these strange phenomena. When you discuss some progressive idea with someone younger than you, and they are much more relaxed about it. But they also don't have the theoretical background that should be necessary. That doesn't have to mean that they are uneducated, but that you needed the education to fight some battles which have already been won. Now the battles are being fought elsewhere, and they require a different education. And that's just the natural progression of human ideas. We went on a tangent to make you aware that both Campbell's ideas and Card's ideas, no, not those ones, just the ones about communicating with aliens, are just a stepping stone. The same is true with cyberpunk, and the same will be true about solarpunk. We can't get great, correct, and perfectly ethical ideas out of thin air. We need to work with transforming what we have here. And that's the problem with creating hieroglyphs. They need to be both fresh and commonly understandable. This means that we either need to make the hero's journey transcend itself or get some alternative storytelling methods into the mainstream. As it stands now, we simply lack the tools to discuss things any other way than a hero who possesses agency to change the world around them. And a single tool is borderline useless in changing society, just like a smartphone without a cell signal and an internet infrastructure and not a fuel cell towers either, just as the signal needs to be accessible everywhere, just like our storytelling tools need to be widely understandable. So who's to blame for us not having alternate methods of storytelling? We're deep enough in this essay without mentioning capitalism, so capitalism. More precisely, the commercialization and professionalization of science fiction. And that's the point we need to talk about Squeakor. Wait, what? The what now core? The word squeakor is composed of two parts. The core suffix in this context means a genre, like grindcore, or microaesthetic, like cottagecore. Squee would be an exclamation of an ecstatic nerd, and that's more or less what it boils down to a genre to make nerds squee. The word is an attempt at giving a name to the currently popular trend in speculative fiction, something to get the nerds excited. Why them? Because these outcasts of old, fascinated with comic books, tabletop RPGs, Star Wars or Star Trek or Battle Stars, are now all grown up and have become a major marketing demographic. To put it in a few sentences, Squeakor is the stuff that's, well, marvelized with token diversity or pop feminism. Remember that bit in Avengers Endgame when all the heroines were walking together? where the characters comment on the events in an ironic and sort of but not really deconstructive way. So that just happened? Am I going to meet somebody today that doesn't shoot lasers from their eyes? Yeah, you and what army? Oh, that army. Run! There's a large influence of young adult fiction or movies, which means the events are to be shown, not experienced through the thoughts or impressions of the main character, who, by the way, almost always has some teenage-like naivety and lack of understanding of the world. And finally, all of this is very liberal in its ideology. In the end, we see the triumph of reason, discussion and moderation, and all extremists are evil. We can think back to the first Spider-Man, where the main bad guy is just a guy who lost his work and company because of the government and big business, so he becomes bad. Luckily, after being defeated by a kid supported by Tony Stark, a billionaire and a real-life Iron Man, oh sorry, I meant the Marvel-life Elon Musk, <laughs> he reasonably accepts the moderate punishment of prison in order to reform him to become a better man, or, you know, Killmonger from the Black Panther movie. 
So anyway, the problem with Squeakor is that it's a vicious cycle. It sells well, so everything is judged in its categories, so more Squeakor is produced, and so on. If you want to achieve a success outside of it, you'd better be a professional writer, and that means having another means of income. So we get more and more of these middle managers, public officials, or well-off academics writing sci-fi. All this leads to what can be called a gentrification of science fiction, where the middle class moves in and the lower class finds it harder to get published. Oh, you weren't at any workshops organized by these famous writers? It's a good idea, they only cost a few thousand dollars. But anyway, I'm afraid we can't publish something written by an unqualified person. Perhaps if some other magazine accepted your stories... And against these odds, you've got this weird solar punk, which doesn't match these standards one bit. So how can we be surprised that the solar punk, which did achieve mainstream success, like the psalm, is a feel-good story, if it's the only kind of story that offers a different narrative, yet still would sell well? We'll leave the question hanging, for now, and to answer it, we've invited our friend, Paweł Ngay, for the second half of this video. We know that a shift in the audio, voice and style may feel like much, but we assure you, if you like our content, you will love what's coming next. Solarpunk, Lenses and Foundations My name is Paweł Ngei, on the internet also known as ALXD. I'm a software developer and hacker, someone analyzing technology outside of the formal framework of a company or university. I'm especially interested in cultural narratives about technology and engineering, their impacts on societies and communities. I first encountered Solarpunk soon after the notes towards a manifesto came to be at Arizona State University in 2014 while looking for a way to express some values of the hacker movement I couldn't convey to the general public. I was able to take part in some discussions and conferences with early creators within the movement, like Adam Flynn or Andrew Dana Hudson. Last year, I co-organized a fully remote Solarpunk conference focusing on the voices from the Global South called SolarizeCon. I'd like to tell you about this movement from a little different perspective than you may have already heard. I'm neither a writer nor a literary expert, but a hacker, technologist, who wants to understand what's missing from our discourse about the tech and the infrastructure, why we cannot express them in our languages and dreams of the future. We might be able to notice much more about the world around us if we purposefully stand between the hard sciences, engineering, and the social literary perspectives, seeing how they influence each other. To define what I'm talking about, maybe let's start with an example story. A story I consider the most solarpunk of the ones I've heard, even if it's pretty far from most of what's published in solarpunk anthologies and magazines. A deadly epidemic starts in one of the poorest countries of Africa. There are no vaccines or effective treatment for it. Most of the infected die suffering, and the only way to combat it is avoiding infection and studying the pathogen further. UN, WHO and Doctors Without Borders send their delegations and teams into the regions, set up field hospitals and want to help in any way possible. The inhabitants of the region are terrified. Whoever has the means and resources flees as fast and far away as possible. The people working in the banking and technological sectors who are left are barely holding the infrastructure together, not being able to count on any external help. Faced with the overwhelming number of infections and tens of thousands of new medical workers, doctors, nurses, paramedics, the financial infrastructure, never very stable or effective, breaks down completely. Local military tries distributing physical banknotes, causing the inflation to skyrocket. Soon, everyone starts weighing them instead of counting. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization sends money, not food and medicines, which need to be bought locally. Without that, and the ability to pay salaries, medical personnel starts striking. Hospitals can barely feed their own patients. Seeing that they are going to starve faster than die of the new sickness, some patients escape hospitals, spreading the epidemic even farther. With the paramedics on strike, bodies end up lying in the streets. The whole economy collapses and the country descends into chaos. Big corporations would love to help, but they cannot afford to send any people into the fray. In the middle of all this, 
Three local hacker technologists contact international NGOs and the UN, claiming that they can stop the country from a total collapse by building an alternative payment system for medical workers, totally fair and transparent, using free software and their second-hand laptops. They can promise that it will not be used to launder any money and everything will go straight to the emergency personnel. They only need permission. With some UN vouching, the president eventually accepts. What's the worst that can happen? To everyone's surprise, the local programmers do exactly what they promised. In two weeks, they create a fully transparent payment system, replacing the failing local infrastructure creating by the big banks, allowing money transfers to the medical personnel and the continued operation of the field hospitals. With that in place, they organize teams registering medical personnel all across the country and making sure everything works. Inspired by their own success, the hackers start tackling other problems, fixing old and broken equipment in the hospitals, creating automated payment machines, registering paramedics' work without a need to remove their safety equipment or signing anything. In the whole country, the medical system starts functioning again, people's hope and faith in it overcoming their fear and chaos. Eventually, the epidemic gets under control. The initiative of the few technologists allowed the work of tens of thousands of medical personnel not to go to waste. Together, they created a miracle, saving hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives. So, we have an epidemic, many of which we will have to face because of the climate catastrophe. We have the weaknesses of the huge structures, like the local government, corporations, even the UN. We have local activists and independent open technologies creating sustainable solutions. We are seeing a perspective from an African region, usually ignored in our discourse about the future and the present. There's conflict, tension, drama, and yes, you could probably write it with a little better pacing and try making it more real, because who would believe that three local guys from Africa can achieve something huge that international corporations cannot? This is not a well-crafted story. It could use a lot more work before it would land in some anthology. The author has some potential though. The problem is, the story has no author. It's not a piece of feel-good fiction, but a very real story from Sierra Leone and the whole West Africa besieged by the Ebola epidemic in 2014. The local guys from IDT Labs are Salton Arthur Masali, Harold Valentine Max Saidu and Francis Banguara. They exist. You can find their social media handles or send them an email. They really saved hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives. Why haven't you heard about them, you could ask. Their story did get covered. A few paragraphs in The Guardian and a talk at a German hacker conference. It didn't get too far in the mainstream media though. It's too alien, too hard to imagine. It's not possible that some random hackers from Sierra Leone could replace their national banking infrastructure, originally created by the great minds of the West, in just two weeks even if they actually did it. Years later, the heroes from IDT Labs got some recognition in the United Kingdom. They got a responsible business award. I think the problem with describing their work is very visible in the telling words of one of the judges from the contest. Think about it. This company actually stopped their core business, even though they were a software developing company, solutions developing company, they stopped their main business and they dedicated all their resources to come up with this because they actually believed and they saw that they needed to do this for their country. You know their country was about to collapse and they needed to do this. As much as I agree with the significance of their work, I am absolutely terrified by a perspective of the world where saving lives is something unexpected, something extra, while a regular company should just continue production and regular functioning not to lose what is the most important, money and profits. For me, this shows one extremely important thing. Our current culture, caught between neoliberalism, postmodernism, cyberpunk and post-apocalyptic narratives, however you want to call them, makes us blind to what is happening around us. We cannot see or describe real events around us which would contradict the mainstream narrative, could get us out of our cultural biases which force us into the ever-present escapism and fatalism. Solarpunk is not just a theoretical set of themes, tropes, aesthetics with a few anthologies published. 
It's a perspective which allows us to see more of the world around us, discover that no, we are not living in cyberpunk, we just accepted such a narrative and normalized its values in our societies. We expect the huge corporations to spy on us, the labor unions to be pointless and hopeless, that any fight against power is unwinnable. What can we do then to imagine different, better futures, which wouldn't be alien and incomprehensible, too big to convey in a single story or image? As you heard before from Think It Through, we will need hieroglyphs, consistent and concise visions of narratives, aesthetics and worlds like Asimov's robots, cyberpunk prosthetics and steampunk's airships. To be able to tell stories without explaining the whole history of our world, its systems and cultures, we need to use hieroglyphs, which our readers, audiences already know from other media. They know what to expect, so we don't need to create boring exposition dumps, suggesting the implications of faster than light travels for our planet. The same way our real world stereotypes about different nations, genders and ethnic groups can be harmful, the cognitive schemas from fictional stories can be projected upon the real world. If we keep watching stories which make some behaviors and ideas seem impossible, eventually we will stop imagining them as realistic in our daily lives. The superhero cinema forces a lot of invisible assumptions and ideas into every movie. It's not only about fighting to maintain the status quo, but about the possibilities of what lies beyond. Every more technologically advanced society you've seen in recent years, be it Atlantis, Wakanda or Asgard, is governed by a system less socially progressive than ours, implying that the social and technological progress are somehow disjointed. Fed with that, we slowly stop expecting that society can evolve along with technology. What's more, we start seeing the technologies themselves only as they are presented, as weapons, single instance artifacts, never infrastructure you could share or modify. Watching the Iron Man, we don't ask ourselves why he's not using his arc reactors to replace gas and coal to combat climate change. This would be too unimaginable. The same way we are taught to see every nuclear technology as a potential weapon, not an energy source, making us never imagine that there might exist real technologies which can't be weaponized, which don't have meltdowns. We don't want people asking their governments about funding such research now, do we? Since solarpunk is not a popular genre yet, it doesn't have the hieroglyphs, visual or narrative themes which could lay seeds in our imagination. It cannot turn our attention to the real world around us and allow us to see it differently with more hope. Until we all have easy access to solarpunk books and movies, giving us the vital context, real stories like the one from Sierra Leone will be impossible to report, too alien, too unnatural, and too far away from what we are taught to expect. That's why the creation of the symbols, hieroglyphs and aesthetics is so important. It's not just an idle game of bored writers trying to find a new niche, but a very conscious social project, a type of activism aiming to convince the society that we can see the world differently, making us imagine worlds better and not less possible than our own. If you search for anything solarpunk on the internet, you might have found scores and scores of images created by neural networks, green skyscrapers, bubble greenhouses, solarized landscapes. In such a crowd, it might take a while until you see something created by a human artist, but it will be visibly distinct, not only because of the correct number of fingers. There are quite a few interesting thoughts to unpack here. We could start by looking at the ethics of neural networks, devouring work of thousands of artists without permission, generating money for whichever company or corporation owns it, proclaiming some kind of democratization as they only centralize more and more power, forcing the rest of us even lower. There was a lot written on that topic already. And no, I do not believe that any corporate owned AI can be solarpunk. What is even more interesting though, is the blandness and unimaginativeness of the neural network's work. Thanks to them, you can spot what I just described. The absolute lack of hieroglyphs, visual language and symbols. The AIs recycle what they have already seen without any creativity and intent, so they imagine our old symbols of the future, but greener, 
with the sun in the background. If they just ate some non-European gallery, maybe there will be a tuk-tuk somewhere? This not only emphasizes how important it is that it's a human, intentional artist who can create a hieroglyph prototype, but also shows us what is missing from our popular culture. The neural networks ate a lot of popular galleries, which, consciously or not, lacked a lot of symbols or hieroglyphs. Our popular culture is devoid of visual marks for a community or sustainable architecture. It's not the neural network's fault that they cannot imagine solar punk. It hasn't been properly introduced yet. We can also take a look at the notion of defaultness, beautifully exemplified by the art AIs. The less you specify the image you are looking for, the more standard, popular, stereotypical and biased it will get. Ask for a scientist. How many of them are women? Ask for a woman. How many of them are Caucasian? How many of them will be pretty teenagers? How many average, realistic, older? The more you specify a person, especially venturing into the global south or away from pretty actors and actresses, the more random and alien the results will be, with weird fingers, ears, double necks and so on. The neural networks ate so few such examples that they are struggling to imagine them. Again, it's not a feature of the neural network. It's a feature of its training sets, of our popular culture, showcasing us what we are blind to, who we can't imagine, what symbols are missing. If I was to say what is a realistic use for such a graphical AI, I would say that, exploring our blind spots, seeing what symbols need to be crafted and forged by an intentional artist. Very similar things can be said about text-based neural networks, mimicking the form, blind to the context and meaning of the paragraphs they spew out. They are as sexist, racist and xenophobic as the text they learned from, without any critical thought as to what they are repeating. I tried asking one of them for a solar punk story, and I got several permutations of the same thing. A community is brave by installing solar panels. Sometimes there is a sci-fi or a fantasy spin, some rebel, evil queen, lost civilization. No notions of relations between the members of the community, between different communities or their values. These weren't in the training set and will need to be crafted separately, intentionally. That's why I am not worried about the artists being culturally replaced by the neural networks, even though I'm sure corporations will try to replace them commercially to centralize even more of their power. Only a human can have an intent, create a new meaning, a hieroglyph to start meaning something, to be shared to mean this whole new beautiful vision. I worked with many artists trying to convey solar punk in their art. Recently, I joined forces with an architectural student who wanted to imagine a greener, sustainable and socially just future for Poland. He didn't want to just copy-paste some Art Nouveau, but really thought about it, created an illustration of a train being loaded with small containers from independent farming co-ops among bike paths and pedestrian architecture. It would be a perfect illustration for a story explaining everything there, but without such context not hidden under a hieroglyph already. Most people see it just as a colorful train. We are not trained to see or expect some things, so we just gloss over them. If we would like to venture even farther, we could look at the language itself. Most solar punk is created in English, with some books available in Portuguese, Spanish and Italian. As the movement itself celebrates diversity, there are writers and editors concerned by the primacy of English, like Francesco Verso, who made it his mission to translate multiple anthologies to languages other than our current lingua franca to convey meanings which can escape it. English is not the only language missing meanings and terms though. Because of the primacy of capitalism and corporate ideologies, some languages which didn't have a word for sustainability before the 1970s never developed one. Polish is one such example, where officially sustainability translates to a very corporate balanced development, a whole slew of concepts so natural and so vital for solar punk are suddenly unexpressible because in Polish 
things cannot be sustainable without being further developed, grown and capitalized upon. One of the missions of solar punks in Poland is to propose a new word for sustainability, like odżywalność, following similar Slavic concepts, coming closer to homeostasis, life and rebirth. It will take a lot of work, but it can clearly be a milestone and a symbol, a very concrete and visible hieroglyph, leading all the others to come. Other languages have similar blind spots, missing words like degrowth, and English itself could learn a thing or two from them, stepping away from colonial and imperial intellectual barriers. As many solarpunk critics note, most books and anthologies intentionally calling themselves solarpunk are either not widely known, mediocre or somehow artificial. Despite Becky Chambers' Hugo Award, we still don't have a single masterpiece to unify all solarpunk values and create a set of hieroglyphs to inspire others. We have a dozen, often conflicting philosophies and manifestos, and the whole cultural movement seems to be driven more by the theorists than the writers and artists. Despite the monumental work of Becky Chambers, Francesco Verso, Serena Ulibari, Ruthanna Emrys or Alex Beckett, a lot of the above accusations are true. No single masterpiece so far inspired dozens of artists with its language and hieroglyphs. I don't know if such a plain mimicking and remixing of symbols wouldn't hurt solar punk. The movement defines itself by its will to self-reflect, using tropes and symbols consciously. We don't want to end up greenwashing or repeating harmful narratives just to be part of something. Otherwise, why wouldn't we take a page from the steampunk's book and paint a solarpunk aristocracy basking in Art Nouveau? Why not focus on the magical greenery, solar panels, letting the aesthetics flow? Why not write a well-crafted book in a familiar form which would easily get popular? The problem is, by blindly repeating such a trope, we will totally lose our drive to envision a better world, instead repeating all the problems that, consciously or not, emerge from it. Aristocracy, while radiating beauty, implies an underclass. Every solar punk story is therefore a very intentional prototype of a hieroglyph, often clumsy and unintuitive. It's an attempt of creating a symbol which will not lead us to the old tracks, but propose a new unexplored path. It's a seed which can sprout into some solid roots in the popular imagination, or wither. When criticizing solar punk's awkwardness, it's also worth realizing that most of the stories, books and anthologies we read are published. This means that they were not only edited, as in had their grammar and spelling checked, but they went through a strong filter deciding which story is marketable and which is not. Thinking about it this way, it's rather obvious. The editors want to publish only things that will sell. They don't reject only books badly written or boring, but also the ones which could be too alien, too hard to understand. What Jay Springett calls cultural fracking. It's a much more financially sound decision to publish a sequel, something reusing already known tropes, than to experiment with something new. This leads us again to Squeakor, about which you already heard from Think It Through. Being a technologist myself, I had a lot of opportunities to help artists, writers and playwrights do research for their current projects. I showed them real technologies, problems they solved and cause, the tensions and drama arising from the invisible infrastructure all around us. It was a very interesting experience as it allowed me to see how many of those projects were rejected by the editors and publishers. Even if the craft of the book, story, script was good, it was deemed too alien as it didn't use the familiar cyberpunk tropes or a typical externalized conflict. A few years ago, I was asked to help write a TV series about hackers fighting pedophiles online. What was initially a series of car chases and cyber duels by some mask-wearing lone wolves was eventually reforged into a deeper narrative about a society and communities within it. The boss of the pedophile group no longer approached children in chat rooms. Instead, he was a philanthropist giving away notebooks to poor, vulnerable children so that they could use the internet at home. 
no teacher or librarian even considered checking them for malware, which gave the pedophiles access to their machines and webcams, which allowed the group to function with industrial efficiency. The hackers in the series, instead of punk cyber jockeys, became activists trying to convince the local authorities to scan the gifted computers, talk to the kids and teach them the basics of privacy of security. The conflicts became much more multidimensional, social and sociological, with the car chase on top. Yet, the whole idea was deemed too non-standard, too alien for an average audience and not worth considering for production. The variety of stories we can tell is limited even by our over-reliance on the hero's journey taught in most schools as applying to all of the myths, legends and plays across all the cultures of the world. The main character needs to be proactive, change across the three to five acts, have a darkest moment, etc, etc. If you are looking for a narrative structure putting a community in the spotlight instead of a single character, you will struggle with most of the Western writing handbooks or TV tropes. We have some notes of groups, teams, one chapter a perspective, maybe even characters representing a whole social class, but still the stories from Southwest Asia, South America or Africa appear ridiculously alien and weird. A passive hero? No tragedy of the commons? Everything we learned at writing schools teaches us that this is wrong, that our basic biology expects a different story structure. So if people from those cultures like theirs, maybe we can force it into hero's journey somehow? Many solar punk writers are aware of this and want to actively explore different narratives and plot types, openly prototyping and exploring how it affects not only the reception, but also the dynamics between the characters and communities, their conflicts, types of violence, emotional as often as physical, and drama in general. A lot of such stories, while brilliant, will not be published in a magazine or an anthology and only the most recognized authors will be able to get such a book past the editorial board. Prototyping alone, you can ask where is the drama in solarpunk stories? Where is the excitement? Many people point out that it's hard to introduce tension in an already established utopia where every battle has been won, the climate, stable, civilization, sustainable, and everyone happy. Why would you need postcards from a paradise? Totally ignoring the inspirational and motivational value of such a postcard, it's worth noting that our cultural tendency to disbelieve visions of flawless places was explored by Ursula Le Guin herself in The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas. If something appears good and doesn't have a hidden dark secret, it's suspicious. Some of the solar punk creators and researchers proposed divisions of the genre into the three ages. The pre-solar punk, a world in which the ideas and hieroglyphs are only beginning to develop, like today. The solar punk, in which the clash between the narratives and perspectives becomes mainstream and influences the shape of the civilization. And the post-solar punk, in which its ideas have already won and the utopia is fully realized. A lot of already published books and anthologies could be classified as the last category for a few reasons. Firstly, it's much easier to inspire others with a vision of a world already materialized, with values already internalized by its societies, where we can show them working in practice. Secondly, it's much easier to publish something less greedy and polarizing or commenting on very real politics. Thirdly, just attempting to imagine a path from here to such a utopia requires an astounding amount of knowledge in many fields. Risky hypotheses about economics, cultures, societies and climate, all of which could easily become outdated and straight on ridiculous. Post solar punk is then a much safer bet to get your story published. Personally, I prefer the second era. Solar punk the time of changes, the clash of ideas, trying to deal with problems in ways which are currently unimaginable. It's a dirty and practical future, often much less inspiring, more tired and full of failure, burnout, but with a lot of hope underneath it all. Such a vision acknowledges the whole upcoming trauma of climate change and the fact that we will not magically get all along, but will need to fight thousands, millions of smaller battles to save a local community, culture, ecosystem. It showcases the daily lives, 
agency and identities of the inhabitants of each small region of our planet. My solar punk is full of stories inspired by thousands and thousands of real-world reports of what is currently invisible, refugee camps turning into bustling cities with their own creoles and cultures, the traumas of millions of miners losing their jobs, experts racing with time to convince the general population to give up their old habits before a new disaster strikes. I see those stories as dripping with drama conflict, even without a single villain, just zooming on the friction between different interest groups sharing the same goal. And even with this all, each of those stories can carry the special solar punk hope, the beauty of working together, the belief that tomorrow can be better. A few years ago, I was approached by teachers from Poland trying to encourage their writing students to create such stories. They were struggling, not seeing the drama where the popular culture didn't prepare them to see it. Together, we decided to create a list of 22 story hooks for them, to easier see the trauma and hope typical to solar punk. Now, thanks to the huge help of Tomasino, we created a solar punk prompts podcast, presenting each of them in 10 to 15 minutes. Since then, I've spoken about those prompts with many writers and I've begun to realize that a big part of why so many people are resistant to writing solar punk is that it requires you to acknowledge the upcoming trauma. While the current popular culture wants you to escape in some fantasy world or straight up give up, surrendering any responsibility, solar punk wants you to admit that we will all suffer. We need to process that without rationalizing or romanticizing it. Only once we do, once we can hold this unpleasant emotion in ourselves, we can begin to see the hope beyond it, the hope which allows us to rebuild, not just a naive fairy tale. I'm sure that there are some deep observations to be made about which authors or cultures are already prepared for such trauma, but I do not feel qualified to make them right now. Seeing this, we could ask ourselves, what's utopian in solar punk? Is this a world in which every battle has been won, now beautiful, just and stagnant, a diverse anarchist society with no violence, no conflicts, no miscommunications? I think anyone who had any experience with an anarchist community or even just working in groups can attest to the absurdity of the image. Working together without miscommunications? arguing over values, hurt feelings, without quarreling over the tiniest detail and the most important axioms? In my opinion, any attempt to imagine a world without toxic hierarchies must be full of dynamic tensions and conflicts trying to convince each other without a quarrelsome social homeostasis. If you want a good example of such story, I heavily recommend Ruthanna Emery's Half-Built Garden, in which most of the plot is built on this exact notion. I could propose a different definition of a utopia for solar punk. It's a world in which everyone acknowledges the problems we're facing, the climate change, unsustainability of our technologies, economies and civilization, and in which everyone agrees to act on that. They don't need to agree on specific steps to take, but they are ready to discuss it. This is a vision of the world I aspire to. One without rejecting reality, without using violence trying to silence someone. This is my inspiration for the future. Okay, but where is the punk in all that? It was supposed to be solar punk, not sunny, everyone get along now. Where is throwing Molotov cocktails at hypercorps? Where are the mocks and being the underdogs? What's punk in starting a garden? What if I tell you that solar punk is a bigger punk than everything above, more than all those runners and street samurai of cyberpunk, because it rejects not only the corporate world, but also the tired mode of rebellion propagated by our popular culture. All the visions of the dark future from the last 40-50 years got us used to a dichotomy, Bad corporations, their wage slaves faithfully serving their rich masters hoping for a payday versus hacker rebels living outside of the system, eternally at war with the corpse and their servants. It's a hopeless war. If it's ever winnable, it will be a perfect temporary win because a lone cowboy cannot shoot the whole system. 
it's even worse because often to achieve such a win they must become a part of it, replicating the same toxic structures, hurting others. It's worth noting that in cyberpunk stories, even Mr. Robot, the victims of the rebels are not only the rich and powerful, but often innocent bystanders. We are supposed to internalize that the fight is immoral in itself, the anarchists are dangerous and about to hurt us. All they do is fight, sabotage and destroy after all. We never see them build anything. Even if they do, it's always desperate, a temporary heaven, just a tool for their war against the system, the corpse, the facet state. They cannot build or propose anything outside of it, outside of the dichotomy, the model of a rebellion which was already co-opted by the corrupted world. The same way we are unable to imagine just walking away and building something outside of it. We're absolutely blind to the real world when we see others doing exactly that. Many people will argue that we need to imagine the fights ahead, that change will not be painless, and I agree. The problem doesn't lie here. The way I see it, cyberpunk romanticizes oppression, fight and struggle. It doesn't want to show us the world worth fighting for, it wants us to revel in being crushed and rebelling, because virtue doesn't lie in finding a way out, it lies in participating in this fight. What's a win state for cyberpunk characters? Who are the ones others tell stories about? It's the martyrs. Cyberpunk glorifies the rebellion to the point of expecting some kind of cyber Valhalla, it's so cool, blinding us with awesome neons, shiny chrome, making us forget we can do something else. For me, the best indicator of whether a narrative is solarpunk is a simple question. Can it portray Wikipedia as a project? Not a means to fight the system, not a tool for manipulation of the masses by the corpse and the government, but as a great civilizational project. Because for me, Wikipedia, despite being flawed and imperfect, is a great project. It's something that generations of science fiction writers dreamed about. The great encyclopedia containing almost the totality of human knowledge available to everyone for free at any moment, built by every one of us as an editor, researcher, scientist, where it's our communities editing and improving it, arguing and building consensus. It's a success for the whole civilization, a wonder of the world impossible to imagine if it didn't exist in the first place. It's so unimaginable that even today we cannot tell stories about it because we lack the hieroglyphs. We cannot see the librarians as heroes, teaching, sharing knowledge, archiving the history of your language and region before it's too late cannot be dramatic for some reason. In my opinion, that's where the punk lies in solar punk, in building alternatives instead of taking part in a hopeless struggle in not allowing to be written into someone else's narrative to become safe because predictable rebel. It's accepting the grassroots movements, collaboration with all its conflicts, imperfections as something beautiful and worth telling stories about. Move quietly and plant things, a quiet work of thousands, millions of people working towards a better tomorrow, towards alternatives, planting small seeds of hope and improving the world bit by bit to grow a forest which will sprout with the power of millions of trees. Scientists and engineers working on free software, activists trying to convince the unconvinced, educators sharing knowledge, people believing in the new narratives, punk towards punks who got stuck in their old battles. And with that, Suddenly, we can see all the real stories we haven't noticed before, all of them more solar punk than many volumes of anthologies. When the nuclear reactor in Fukushima, Japan, suffered a meltdown following the earthquake in 2011, the governmental infrastructure and response systems weren't ready. In the whole region there were only a few radiation monitoring stations with data available to the responders. They couldn't say which areas were contaminated and which were not. 
In panic, the government moved people from practically untouched zone to a much more dangerous region. In the following weeks, not everyone responded with anti-nuclear panic though. A group of local hackers and technologists created a safecast, a radiation counter connected with a GPS module which automatically uploaded their measurements to a map, creating radiation gradients precise up to one meter. The activists gave the devices away to people from the region and then to the whole of Japan, who meticulously mapped the contamination more precisely than even the best military or scientific organizations. Everything was based on free software and open technologies, without any surveillance or reliance or on any private business attempting to commercialize the project. Inspired by their success, Citizen scientists from all over the world started using safecasts to map their own countries, be it on foot, on bicycle, by driving a car or riding a train. In my opinion, this is the punk we were looking for. Coming back to books, anthologies and magazines, a lot of people starting their solar punk journey with Becky Chambers' Hugo award-winning Psalm for the Wild Build may see it as a very philosophical book, beautiful in its own right, but not very connected to our current problems, not offering the hope we so desperately need. For them, I have a few recommendations, not in any particular order. Walk Away by Cory Doctorow, who, like me, is a hacker and technologist first and foremost. While his perspective on culture and society might strike you as very peculiar, most of his books are the next Tuesday science fiction, focused on here and now, not a world in a thousand years. I don't want to spoil too much of The Walk Away, but half of it is solar punk, focused on building alternatives to our current civilization, and the other half is post-cyberpunk, coming back to the conflict, but on very different terms. The characters from the book decide to leave the capitalist cities, the titular walkaway, and create their own sustainable outposts using open technologies. They use real-life open-source blueprints published by the UN and NGOs around it, originally for the Global South refugees, not people giving up the comforts of the city. The characters create their own communities, learn how to get closer to each other and share their hopes and fears building something new together. They collaborate with other outposts all around the world, avoiding hierarchies and violence. If they cannot agree to what they see around them, they have again the right to walk away. Cory Doctorow notices how much drama can be seen in the times of change. He sketches the characters who wholeheartedly want to build a better world and yet are limited by their very human flaws, traumatic pasts prone to conflicts and quarrels. In time, together they work out a plan for something much bigger than themselves, and the outside world comes back, not willing to forget about them. The conflict intensifies, adding new layers, straying farther and farther away from mere philosophical musings. The hope in Walkaway stems not from a vision of peace, but the conviction that even the biggest challenge can be overcome together. Ruthanna Emrys paints a similarly bold vision in her half-built garden, envisioning a world between the age of solar punk and post-solar punk, slowly regenerating environmentally and settling into a new social balance between the new eco-anarchist majorities, old governments and the remnants of the corporations. What sounds like a setup for a war gets interrupted by a staple trope of a bygone era, the first contact with another civilization, this time not handled by communists or capitalists, but a young mother, water sensor technician, carrying her baby in a sling as she is about to run some maintenance. While not being perfect, the garden impressed me with the framing of its conflict, making it clear that it cannot be violent, it must be resolved diplomatically, or everyone loses. Despite the stakes being very global, the story is deeply personal, maybe even to the point of irrelevance of some of its subplots. I really appreciate the weight Ruthanna Emrys puts on the most important technology in her world, the social and technological network which allows people to reach consensus and move forward with their decisions. It's not a representative democracy, not a meritocracy, but a transparent system which includes everyone. The Garden touches on one more important issue of solar punk interest, the shape, meaning and function of the family, be it blood or found. 
it not only includes different definitions of gender roles, but openly asks a lot of questions, which I will not spoil. If you're interested in transparency, LX Beckett's Game Changer has a bold proposal. It's a story of the whole civilization, almost collapse in the setback, what a euphemism, now rebuilding in a very different way. Following several characters, we can see daring proposals slowly painting a cohesive image of a very different but still recognizable world. After the age of social networks, there was no putting the cat back in the bag. Every information about everyone is public, making corruption much, much harder. The currencies are based on sequestered carbon, making intercontinental flights virtually unaffordable, allowed only in the greatest emergencies. The private property is almost totally gone, with everyone equipped in a toothbrush and a computer terminal only. The housing is managed by local communities, assigned according to needs. That's not a communist ascetism. Everyone is free to decorate their place in ubiquitous AR and VR, inviting over friends from all over the world, so close despite the travel being so expensive. People share their experiences gaming, going to clubs and concerts, and the gamification previously serving capitalist addictions now motivates everyone to care about their surroundings, watering the plants in the public park or remotely piloting a farming drone at the other side of the globe. Whether this world is a utopia or a dystopia is up to you to judge. What I appreciate is the boldness of the proposal, a world which doesn't shy away from changes, a prototype of a world bigger and more complex than a lot of the shorter stories you can find elsewhere. There are a lot more visions, equally deep and ambitious, offering us solid new hieroglyphs to analyze, reuse and embrace, or discard as something not useful, ill-fitting or ineffective. Do we really want to imagine a future without privacy? Are biotechnologies more important than material engineering? What is the place of an individual within a society, a community? To fully outline and understand Solarpunk, we need one more extremely important aspect. Its willingness to look outside of the West, allowing people from all over the world, especially from the global South, to tell their own stories and share their local problems and perspectives. Solarpunk futures are not just globalized cities in the US or China, but also communities in Malaysia, Colombia, Burkina Faso or Czechia. Every region has its own problems and solutions, which may not work somewhere else. There's no point in comprehensive heating infrastructure in Kenya, while Poland doesn't need to prepare for earthquakes. The same way, every culture, society and community may want to paint its own vision of the future, working together with others and sharing knowledge, but not losing its own identity in some globalized soup. Solarpunk wants to create a space for that, invite them to a debate, a multi-voiced chorus of ideas and dreams. While in the global English-speaking culture, there are very few near sci-fi books tackling the real problems like the climate change, there are even fewer such books coming from the global south. Many post-colonial countries are struggling with finding a new narrative for themselves, especially given the economies of the publishing market. It's much, much easier to sell an African poverty porn story than a dream of independence and a hopeful sustainable future from the continent. Even outside of that, a lot of regions have their identities, cultures, coupled with technologies which are becoming more and more obsolete, like Polish Silesia and its coal mining. Most local writers feel much safer in repeating cyberpunk dystopias set in local languages and aesthetics, unwilling to create a bold and realistic vision of the region, transitioning out, knowing all the trauma needed to be processed for that. Solarpunk encourages us not to resist what's inevitable and to embrace change, prepare for it by envisioning who we might be afterwards, towards what future we could go forward. We will need a lot of prototypes, some of them naive, some of them counterproductive, but nonetheless worth working on so that we can try out what works and what doesn't. We should still be wary about accepting something without knowing its context, especially if the representation might be superficial, like Marvel's Wakanda, being more of an Afro-American dream of the utopian Atlantis than an actual dream of anyone from the sub-Saharan region. 
let's hear the actual voices from all over the world, not only these filtered by Western film schools or universities. I've already seen an East African take on Ghost in the Shell, people musing about the Nigerian high school anime, and let's not forget that the very first solar punk anthology came to us from Brazil. Wrapping up my essay, I'd just like to re-emphasize two of the thoughts I consider the most important. Firstly, solar punk is both a lens with which we can see more of the real world, otherwise invisible and easy to ignore, and the foundation, a series of prototypes upon which we can build a new language with which we can describe a better tomorrow. Secondly, such a utopia doesn't need to be a static and boring paradise. It can be a dynamic and dramatic homeostasis full of tensions. The utopianism may lie in the fact that everyone acknowledges the problems around us and works towards solving them, sharing a will to overcome conflicts. Such is the solar punk I would like to create and read. And such is the solar punk I wish you all. Or at least that's one way to think that through. And that was the highlight of this video, folks. We'd like to ask one more thing on behalf of Pavel. Please do comment and let him know what you thought. Oh, and I mean really, not just to drive engagement. But please do that too. Like and subscribe and share and so on. But he's always very interested in what people think of his work and he's probably going to be active in this comment section for months to come. And after his holidays, so near the middle of the month. Also, please remember to check out his podcast on Solarpunk prompts and his online Solarpunk discussion panel. Links in the description. He'd also love to hear what you think on Mastodon or by email. As for us, thanks so much for listening until the end. Stay tuned for more updates. But first and foremost, all the best and special thanks to our lovely backers, whom you can see right now on the screen. You make this possible, each and every one of you. If you're here or not, you have a special place in our hearts. If you're not on the list and you should be, or don't have the Backer Discord access, please let us know. We'll fix that ASAP. Also, if you have the means, support us on Patreon. Each and every euro actually makes a difference. It may sound cliche, but as creators, we found out that it's actually true, especially with the whole crisis thing going on. That said, please remember to take care of you and yours first. No worries, we'll survive. On that note, we might be slow because winter always tends to be a slower season for us. Well, more like for Pan S or Mr. S, the scriptwriter. Hmm, maybe S stands for solar? He definitely works much better when it's sunny out. Basically like a big plant that makes sunlight into words. Oh well. We've recently been held up a bit by a Polish side project. Because of the whole JK Rowling mess, we decided to make a short video focusing on what actually happened, a play-by-play -play of what she did and when, and whether it was bad. The video ended up being almost two hours long, took like 10 days of all time devoted to our channels to research and write, and then about a week more to record and put together, even though it was only screenshots. But that was a ton of screenshots. We were asked to do this video in English as well, but we're not sure yet. On the one hand, it doesn't fit the profile of this channel. On the other, there are better and longer videos out there. And on the third hand, we're known in Poland as people who disenchant leftist ideas and make them accessible. This video turns out to be very popular, as it was aimed at regular folks who don't really know anything about Rowling aside from that she liked a tweet or two and got cancelled by queer activists even though she supports lesbians or something. So if you think that makes sense, let us know. We're expecting it to delay the next one by like a week or two. Either way, that one is going to be an analysis of bad degrowth criticisms. And it's actually going to come sooner rather than later, because, as an experiment, it's being written first in English and then translated to Polish. So the English version will come out just a few days after the Polish one. And if you like bad degrowth criticisms, there's nothing better than John the Duncan's video on the absolute thing that was Peter Coffin's video on degrowth. Link in the description. So, that's all for today. Now. 
if you excuse me, I'd like to touch some grass and take a walk in the forest, as it is time that snowdrops are blooming, and as you can see on the screen, my nearby forest is just loaded with them. So, take care, and see you again next time. Bye-bye.